Thank you very much, Katia. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And I would also like to thank you for all your um, effort uh, organizing and keeping the seminar. It's a really uh, nice event. And I remember at the beginning of the lockdown, it was a really, really uh, pleasure for me uh, to have the opportunity of uh, see so many uh, faces and, and good works uh, via this, this seminar. So thank you for, for all the effort. Uh, so today I'm going to present um, some work in collaboration with Giovanni Kobi and Ankara Gulan, who I think they are around in the audience. Uh, they are from the University uh, of Heidelberg in, in Germany. And I'm going to talk about uh, the Calderon problem uh, for uh, non-local operators. So in order to start with the topic, let me um, give you a very uh, brief introduction to the uh, Calderon problem for, for the fractional Laplacian, which was introduced by Edwin uh, Goss, Nico Salo, and Gunther Ullmann in uh, a few years ago, and in which uh, what uh, we have is, uh, okay, let us start uh, with the direct problem. So we have the, uh, 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 so, so the problem related with the Rodinger equation, but changing the usual Laplacian by the fractional Laplacian. So for those less familiar with this operator, uh, you can see here uh, some possible definitions together with some uh, conditions I will keep in mind for the rest of the talk. So S will be a number between zero and one, omega will be an open bounded set, and Q will be a, a bounded function. So notice that in the direct problem, uh, once we change the Laplacian by the fractional Laplacian, since now this is an operator C in the whole space, and uh, not uh, not as before, uh, the the Dirichlet problem uh, or the Dirichlet condition changes from data on the boundary uh, of the set to data on the exterior of the set. So notice uh, first of all this difference. And we, uh, related with us, um, the 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 uh, uh, Dirichlet to Neumann map, which uh, keeps the information about the knowledge we will have uh, when we want to 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 um, state the, the inverse problem, uh, encodes the information about data in the exterior and. Uh, the uh, fractional Laplacian applied to the solution of the uh, previous problem with this particular exterior data. So now, as we usually have for inverse problem, the question we have to, to answer is whether we can determine uh, the potential Q from the knowledge of this Dirichlet to Neumann map. So the problem, as I said, was introduced by uh, Gosalo and Ullmann, and they started giving uh, the, the solutions to the uh, usual questions when we address an inverse problem. So in particular, uh, they prove uniqueness even from partial data, meaning that is enough if we impose uh, exterior data, for instance, in a set of uh, like this, uh, in the exterior domain of of omega, and we measure the digital autonomous map in some uh, other or the same, but in just another uh, subset of this exterior domain. The reconstruction, which was also addressed uh, together with uh, Ankana Ruland, uh, uh, even holds from a unique measurement. This means that, again, that if we impose here some function f, of course, non uh, different from zero. Uh, and we take a measurement of the corresponding digital to Neumann map uh, applied to F here. This is enough in order to um, to in order to 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 know how the potential is at least uh, under some uh, regularity condition. And uh, last uh, but not least, the stability uh, uh, was also studied by uh, Ankana Rulan and Nico Salo and similar to the, to the classical Calderon uh, problem. This is uh, conditional and it has a modulus of continuity of logarithmic type. What, nevertheless, the key point um, uh, uh, above all these results, or at least the results about uniqueness and reconstruction from even one uh, single measurement. 
So here the key point which makes this uh, fractional Calderon problem so different from the uh, classical Calderon problem is the anti-locality of the fractional Laplacian. What does it mean? So this result, which has been proved by different people, uh, I'm not like uh, being very, very precise with the, with the um, uh, references and so on. Uh, but this means that uh, if a function q is equal to zero in a subset of the whole real space, together with the fractional Laplacian applied to it, we can conclude that then our function is equal to zero everywhere. This means that the, uh, that the fractional Laplacian is an anti-local operator. Uh, this can be seen as a unique continuation property, but global. Why is that? Uh, because although the equation is satisfied just, uh, uh, just in a region, we can uh, make the conclusion about the uh, triviality of U everywhere. Another remark about this point is that uh, uh, this condition of being anti-local or this property of being anti-local is something which only uh, non-local operators uh, can, uh, can satisfy. Uh, for the case of local operators, if we want to conclude that the function uh, is zero everywhere, then we could consider that u is zero in, in a subset but the equation, so here imagine this S is not present, the equation should be satisfied everywhere to arrive to the same conclusion. Nevertheless, although this is a property, as I said, that um, only non-local operators uh, can have, not all of them uh, uh, are like uh, admissible operators for satisfying this property. If we consider non-local operators, which uh, do not see the whole space like the fractional Laplacian does, then we cannot expect uh, them to be anti-local and only uh, directionally anti-local. Let me give you an example. So here we have an operator of order third S, which just sees uh, what happens uh, at the right of the point uh, where we evaluate our operator. So then maybe I can even have a picture. So if we have a function of this type, up to this point, uh, the value of A of U will be equal to zero. So then there's no way of concluding. I mean, so here U and A of U will be zero and there's no way uh, to conclude from that that uh, U must be also uh, uh, zero in the left. So as I said, operators like, like this cannot be anti-local, but they could be uh, directionally anti-local. Uh, and this is uh, in particular the case of the operator in the example, um, which Ishikawa in the, in the 80s proved uh, that this operator is anti-local to the right, meaning that if the function and the operator apply to it uh, vanish in an interval of the real line, then we can conclude so here, uh, zero is uh, miss. So that u is zero. So u is uh, u is zero in a plus one two. Uh, in this talk, uh, we will focus on the generalization of this uh, property to higher dimensions. So we will talk about anti-locality in cones, which is a concept intro introduced by Ishikawa in, in 1989. So as I said, I mean, uh, if, uh, so anti-locality can be the effective in the case of uh, um, operators in the whole space. Anti-locality in cones uh, can be expected in uh, operators seeing cones. So this is what I want to introduce now uh, in this slide. So let us consider uh, a open convex cone. So we can keep in mind the two-dimensional case because uh, I, I've been I've been introducing like many pictures, but all of them, of course, are in two dimensions. So uh, for the purpose of uh, getting the ideas, I think this is more than enough. And we are going to focus it in this talk in these two operators we have here. One is symmetric and the other is anti-symmetric. So in both cases, we have elliptic operators. In the first case, although the integral in both cases 
uh, are in, in the in the over the, the convex cone we are choosing. Since here we are also seeing uh, the, uh, the the opposite uh, points, this uh, this operator S uh, sees. So when we apply to to a function, uh, the the result depends on how the function is in both uh, in both uh, cones in the cone and the, the symmetric one. While this one only sees uh, the 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 constant. Well, these operators appear uh, as generators of uh, stable Levy processes. And uh, just for if you are interested here, you can check uh, the Fourier uh, symbols. At least uh, up to some uh, particular value of S in the case of anti symmetric, we should include something else uh, for the cases equal one half. So as I said, I'm going to focus on these two uh, particular uh, operators. At the end, I will mention some uh, some generalizations of them. So let us start uh, by studying uh, the inverse problem associated with this symmetric operator. But uh, before that, we have to uh, go through the direct problem associated with that. So this is uh, this is our problem similar to the one we had for the fractional Laplacian, but just changing the fractional Laplacian by S. And now, in order to define uh, the, the weak formulation of the problem, we can introduce this bilinear form we have here, which comes from considering uh, just the, the, the testing of, uh, of the operator S with uh, applied to functions U with functions compactly supported and smooth in RM. So this is what uh, we could consider. Uh, notice that the, the, this operator, so it sees points X and Y, uh, which are connected by the by the uh, double cone. So the figure, you, you can check what T square means uh, uh, for, for, for our, or, or for in our notation. Uh, but there, there is, a, there is a, an important point to notice. So uh, when we consider the operator S here, as I, as I have said, this operator only sees uh, the function in the, in, in the cones coming from the point of evaluation. So in other words, when we consider S of U in omega, the only important information about U is uh, the one contained in this cone uh, uh, coming from omega. So this is the collection of points um, which are in the cone of some point inside omega. Then, uh, so then what happens here or there doesn't affect uh, the solution of our problem here, right? Therefore, uh, we could impose uh, exterior data only in this uh, region. I'm trying to under uh, to remark or to emphasize there. Uh, which is the, the, the region with uh, which the operator sees uh, when we consider the solution. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, define our weak solution based on this linear form with data restricted to, to, this, uh, to, the, to the meaningful uh, part of the exterior domain of omega, and then to consider functions just restricted to the to the uh, cone of omega. Whatever happens uh, above this this uh, this region is not going to be important at all for our problem. So this is the, the I mean with this we can define the weak solution, but just notice that since this bilinear form is defined in the whole space, we need to consider uh, extensions of the solution uh, of the uh, function u. Uh, so everything is well defined, although at the end of the day, this doesn't appear when we compute this particular uh, bilinear form where D is supported only in omega. Uh, but if the, the, this part uh, is not so important, we could also consider to exclude it uh, from the, our definition of the bilinear form. So now I'm presenting you another bilinear form, which comes from this uh, uh, from this testing, asymmetrization, but here 
This is true only for uh, functions B supported in Omega, which at the end keeps the information we need for the for, for defining a uh, uh, weak solution. Uh, under this situation, so under under this uh, uh, definition of the linear form, where you can see that we don't see anything uh, above or farther than the the the, the region uh, of the cones of omega, then we, uh, taking extensions of the solution is not necessary at all, and we can define the weak solution as you can see here. So no extension of U has been used. Uh, just a, a quick remark. So here I'm considering a spaces, uh, so sobol F spaces, H S spaces, but we could also consider uh, some weaker spaces uh, based on, on uh, work by Felsinger, Kasman, and Boyd, and which uh, or uh, whose main difference is that they are not symmetric. So very briefly, you can see here that the condition we impose about this uh, about this expression. Uh, is uh, different in the role or play, um, plays different roles uh, in uh, one variable and the other. But I'm not going to enter in details about this uh, remark. Just to conclude this part about the direct problem, saying that uh, both definitions, the one based on the bilinear form seen the whole space and the one based on the bilinear form restricted to the uh, meaningful uh, uh, domain for, for the problem uh, agree at the end of the day and that we can uh, we have proved well possibleness uh, uh, of the problem if uh, zero is not an agent value. So with uh, this condition that zero is not an agent value for the associative problem uh, we uh, are in the good setting to define to define the the, the uh, analog uh, led to normal map. So previously, I was defining it for the fractional Laplacian as the, as the fractional Laplacian of the solution associated to a particular exterior data. But I mean, in order to define that properly, what we use in between is the, is the bilinear form uh, related with the problem. Here, since we have two bilinear forms, we could consider uh, two different definitions of the Dirichlet to Neumann map. So you see here the one related with the tilde, the linear form here you would have uh, the other one. So uh, just one simple or one quick remark is that, so remember when we were considering the, the linear form with the tilde, so we were seeing the whole space. In other words, uh, when we have this, uh, we are going to see um, unless H lives in omega, which is the case we are not interested in, uh, we are going to see how the solution um, is also uh, beyond the, 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 the meaningful domain. So in order to avoid um, uh, the, to avoid uh, having to choose a, a good extension or, of the solution, here we are going to restrict our attention to the case of exterior data, uh, roughly speaking, supported in the in the meaningful domain. So the exterior data will live here and here, but taking the extension by zero in the in the not consider uh, or not seeing uh, uh, parts of the of the space uh, will be uh, will be a good extension. So in this case, we are going to consider global functions or functions defined everywhere, but uh, in such a way that the, that the extension by zero is, 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 a, good, is a good one. Uh, nevertheless, without going into more details about this, let me say that, uh, I mean, we have proved that uh, both uh, Dirichlet to Neumann maps are well-defined and bounded. In the, first, uh, in the first case, so in the case of the, the Dirichlet to Neumann map defined via the, the linear form in the whole space, um, what we obtain is, uh, uh, at least in distributional sense, uh, we obtain the operator S applied to the solution. So more or less uh, uh, the same we had for the fractional Laplacian. And this is also true uh, for the uh, for the other bilinear or for the other Dirichlet to Neumann map provided some uh, some geometric conditions are satisfied. So we have the equality uh, between both uh, Dirichlet to Neumann maps. So the equality uh, 
and uh, the, the, the equality between both Jiris Betun and Mamat um, holds, provided the intersection of the uh, set what we take the measurements of the of the Dirichlet map and the set where we are uh, where the, the, the stereo data is, is supported. Uh, so the cone uh, the cones coming from this uh, from this set uh, is or are contained in the in the cones coming from omega. So this is more or less what I'm trying to represent in this picture here. Of course, if the intersection is uh, is empty, then the the equality will always hold. So now let us move to the uh, to the key point of this uh, of this uh, talk, or one of the key points, which is the anti-locality in cons. And as I said, this was introduced by Ishikawa in uh, 1889, and he so the definition in the same way as we were defining uh, or we were saying what being anti-local for the fraction on Laplace means. Uh, so we will say that uh, an operator is uh, anti-local uh, anti in, in, in the cones uh, C or C anti-local if for any function vanishing here and uh, whose operator applied to it also vanishes here, we can conclude that then the function is zero in the uh, one side cone of omega. We can also give the definition for the for the two cones. Uh, so in the case of uh, in the case of our symmetric operator, uh, what we uh, should think, as I said, is the anti-locality in 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 both cones, in the cone one minus cone coming from from our omega, and uh, in our in our uh, paper, we were proving some partial uh, uh, cone anti-locality anti uh, results for, for, the, for the operator. I'm considering uh, M bigger than 2 because in the case of S uh, of N equal to 1, what we have is nothing else but the fractional Laplacian in one dimension, and uh, uh, we have anti-locality for that. Uh, so, so, yeah, we have some results. Uh, instead of uh, going through the through the letter, let me go uh, through the through the picture. So in one case, um, what we have is that uh, S of U vanishes outside omega in this in the cone outside omega, and we assume U vanishes uh, everywhere outside omega. And from those two conditions, we can conclude that the function must be also equal to uh, zero here. The second statement uh, tells us that if we assume S of U and U vanish here and here, uh, and in addition, um, uh, U vanish is also uh, there. So, sorry, sorry. So if uh, U and S of U vanish in omega, and in addition, U vanish also in this set here, so then we can conclude that U must vanish also in these uh, cones, which are uh, the cones uh, coming from the intersection of all cones uh, uh, with origin inside of it. Uh, but the main, uh, so, so what I want you to uh, focus on uh, from now on is, let us assume our operator is uh, anti-local in both cones, and let us see what implications this condition has. So the first implication I want to uh, tell you about is the Runge approximation. So a density result for the solutions of the of our of our original problem. So we can prove uh, that given omega and given another set uh, W whose cones contain omega then the set of solutions of our problem which was here with the exterior data in this set uh, w are dense uh, so the restrictions of these solutions in omega um, is a is a is a um, dense set in this space of functions defined over omega uh, and let me remark that the condition on w is necessary so if this cone does not contain omega, 
uh, then uh, counterexamples uh, could be uh, found. And finally, I mean, usually when we have a rent approximation result, we uh, always keep in mind, uh, together with it, uh, the concept of uh, unique continuation or weak unique continuation. So in this case, let me say that if we consider that our operator is uh, anti-local in cones, we can obtain the weak unique uh, continuation uh, um, as a consequence of that, at least for uh, C1 uh, domains, which are connected. And just for those who may be less familiar with the concept of weak unique continuation, what we have is that our whole equation vanish, uh, vanishes in omega, and then u is a solution, um, sorry, u vanishes in a subset of omega. Um, and then, at least for uh, local operators, what we can conclude is that u then is zero in omega. But here, because of the anti-locality, we can go from omega also to the uh, cones uh, coming from it. From it. Nevertheless, we are in a inverse problem seminar, so let us see all the implications, uh, what I've uh, told you so far, have in the case of the Calderon uh, problem for um, for our, oper uh, our operator S plus the potential Q. So the question, similarly to what we have at the beginning, is whether we can determine the potential Q from the knowledge of the uh, dirichlet Neumann map. But here, keep in mind, we were working with two different definitions of uh, dirichlet Neumann map. Uh, despite this difference, uh, we can prove uh, uniqueness uh, also, as in the case of the fractional Laplacian, from partial uh, data and infinite measurements. Uh, but here, new conditions about uh, where the, the, the data and where the measurements are taken um, appear because of this uh, in, uh, non isotropy behavior of our operator S. So, what we can see is okay, we are given omega, of course, uh, the set where we impose data, which is, uh, or the set where the data we are given. Is supported must be con must be inside the, the cones of omega. So this is where we uh, have our our exterior data, and B will represent the set or uh, also in the cone of omega uh, where the where the Dirichlet Neumann map uh, is measured. So the conditions uh, for for uh, proving uniqueness from partial data. Uh, with measurements here and, and, and data imposed there, um, require that uh, the cones of these two sets contain our original domain of meter. Very briefly, what's the idea of the proof? So the proof follows from Alessandrini's identity, which in our case reads like that. So you see uh, the difference of the potentials. Uh, times uh, uh, um, the product of solutions uh, of the problem U1 and U2 associated with functions F1 and F2 um, is equal to the difference of the dirichlet lett Neumann map uh, applied to them, as you can see here. And now we are taking F1 uh, to, to, this would be uh, blue, uh, F1 supported uh, in, in W, and F2, sorry, uh, supported in, in B, which is the domain we are seeing. So we don't need more than apply our root approximation result, just approximating U1 by one, which is a, a good function, and U2 uh, by, by any function in L2 to conclude by density that then uh, Q1 and Q2 must be the same. But, uh, as in the case of the fractional Laplacian, we can or even go further and prove uniqueness uh, from one single measurement. So now, again, this is the set where we uh, impose our exterior data, which, uh, I mean, we just need to be supported here and different from zero. And this, for instance, is the set where we are going to take uh, our measurement of the Dirichlet to normal uh, map. So now um, 
the condition uh, or the geometric condition, uh, uh, we need uh, only only is required for the for the for the um, region uh, where the Dirichlet tunnel map is measured, which is exactly what I'm representing there. So sorry, I didn't mention it later, but uh, in the previous result, uh, uh, the uniqueness was follow uh, was uh, following a box if we consider uh, the digital autonomous map uh, without the tilde or the one with tilde. Here, uh, nevertheless, there is a, a, a difference between both cases. So in the case of considering that we uh, have measured the digital autonomous map associated with the bilinear form only seeing uh, the, the meaningful uh, region, then further conditions are um, are required to the to the sets B and W. We will see it uh, by the by the proof. Uh, this is just an idea. Um, so remember that the the bilinear tunnel map with the tilde, the one uh, related with the bilinear form seeing uh, the whole space, uh, corresponds at least in a weak sense with the operator of the solution. So. Notice that if we know F and we know this uh, this uh, function here, which corresponds, as I said, to the to the operator of uh, applied to U in the in the set B by the uh, anti-locality of the operator, we can say that or we can propagate our information from B to the cone of B, which in particular contains omega. So in this way, we are able to um, to know how u is uh, in omega. And because now we have all the information to compute the operator s of, of u here, because the region which uh, the operator c is, uh, is uh, so how the function is now is uh, uh, everywhere defined. So we can uh, obtain both u and s of u. Now we pay attention to the equation and we just uh, see that then Q can be computed as you see there. At least uh, provided the, 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 the solution U does not vanish in any open set of, uh, of omega. Okay, if U vanishes uh, here, for instance, we will be in trouble. Nevertheless, this is not possible. Why? Because if U vanishes here, uh, we have uh, seen previously that with unique, with unique continuation holds. So we have a solution of the problem in omega, we have u vanishes in a subset of that, and therefore u should vanish in the cones coming from omega. So everywhere inside these lines. But this in particular implies that u vanishes here, where we have imposed that this is equal to f, and this is different from zero. So we arrive to a contradiction uh, saying that then this question here will be qualified. So uh, we have seen that uh, despite this uh, somehow weaker notions of anti-locality and the fact of having operators just, uh, just in cones, uh, we can uh, achieve um, results for the Calder for the associated Calderon problem. Uh, uh, in the same uh, spirit of the fractional case. So we will, we have also uh, uniqueness, even from one single measurement uh, and partial data, uh, but we need to require uh, more, uh, or we have more constraints about the sets where the measurements are taken because of this um, dependence uh, uh, with the geometry of the operator. Now I would like to uh, mention a little bit more about the uh, anti-symmetric operator A, which is, um, I recall the definition here. So before I was joining like, uh, the definitions for different ranges of S in one, in one line, here I made the, the splitting. In the case S equal to one half, uh, another line should be written, but since, um, uh, since that case, uh, uh, introduces introduces problems even for the direct uh, problem of the associated with the operator. Uh, we will not consider that case. But in 
Yeah, but what I'm going to present now is similar to, to what we had uh, before, the direct problem, the DDB to normal map, and the, the Calderon problem associated with the operator A, but I will just focus on the main differences with respect to the with respect to the to what we have seen so far. So I'm not going to enter in the in all details, but just paying attention to the difference between an operator seeing both cones in a similar way or just seeing one of them. So now this is uh, our problem here. I already uh, introduced uh, or specified that the the, the data uh, is the data um, or is sufficient if we impose data just in this part of the uh, exterior of omega because it's the only part that the operator A is going to see in omega. And now I introduce here the bilinear form. Uh, so the one analog to the B field that we had earlier seen the whole space. So once more here, this corresponds to a, U, and B, if everything is uh, smooth and, uh, uh, and yeah, smooth. But here B, I mean, this is true at any point. So, so B is not restricted to be supported in omega. So we can define the, the weak uh, solution in a similar way and so on. But as I said, I'm going to focus on the, on the main differences. And one of them is that in the case of uh, S greater than zero, uh, the information or the, the data we are imposing, although I was saying, yeah, it's here, the important part, uh, maybe it's not clear the way it's written, but it should also contain information about this part or about the function in this part of the boundary. So this is because uh, somehow when we take extensions uh, to the whole space, we cannot let us say, paste a function here um, with, uh, yeah, paste a function here uh, with any function uh, there. So we, can, we need to extend our function from here to there, so u is one well one. So in other words, uh, at least in this range, f must contain also not only non-local data, so local in uh, non-local in the sense of uh, in a in a volume, but also local data as a uh, usual uh, Laplace. Uh, I can also say that uh, in the same way as we were doing so far with the uh, symmetric operator, we could introduce another linear form, not seeing the whole space, but just the the the, the meaningful uh, region. But yeah, I mean, because of uh, time and because uh, things are more complicated and in, they have a shorter uh, development, I'm not going to enter uh, in details about that. And just go or move to the to the definition of the dirichlet to normal map. So once more, uh, provided we uh, we don't have a, I mean, zero is not an even value of our problem. So uh, in this case, uh, what I want to, to remark is that, uh, I mean, recalling what we had earlier, if we define our Dirichlet uh, to Neumann map via the previous linear form, so what we obtain at this in which sense is exactly uh, the, the, the operator A applied to you. And remember the operator A uh, sees uh, information in this cone. So if we take measurements of the Dirichlet to normal map here, notice that all the information we are going to capture is just information we already have, because this is where we were imposing uh, the data. Uh, and what we need is to capture information about the solution there. So that's why I'm going to define the Dirichlet to normal map in this other region, because in this, in all these uh, points, if I take, compute the um, operator A, I'm going to capture at least some information about the solution inside Omega and no, not only information we already have. So this is important. And now uh, what about anti-locality in one home and room approximation? So again, um, we have some partial results about anti-locality for dimension, uh, dimensions uh, greater or equal than two. 
and then uh, the anti-locality for n equal one. So you, uh, I mean, I already uh, mentioned the work by Ishikawa when I introduced the example of a non-local, a uh, non-anti-local uh, operator. So he proved it. We also have proven it even for s equal one half. Although, as I said, I'm not considering it here. And we uh, were also able to um, prove the quantitative version of this anti-locality in common uh, for dimension one. Uh, once we assume anti-locality uh, anti in, in this cone, uh, we can also obtain room approximation results. And here, once more, there are some necessary conditions on the set where uh, we consider uh, our supported our uh, studio data. And one main difference I want to highlight is that now the anti-locality in only one cone does not imply uh, with unit continuation as uh, it was doing uh, for the case of uh, symmetric operators. So in particular, for S smaller than one half, uh, we can see that weak unit uh, continuation uh, might vary and dimension greater than two uh, as uh, I mean, uh, yeah, because in the other way, there's no so many uh, directions to escape from that. And now the corresponding Calderon problem. So once more, let me say where uh, our uh, exterior data uh, will be supported. So remember, uh, our exterior data must be supported um, or must be must live in the cone of omega, but the measurement of the Dirichlet to Neumann map must be taken in the opposite cone. So we can capture information about how you how the solution uh, the solutions are in the uh, region omega. And similarly to before, we can prove both uniqueness from infinite measurements. Or, or even from one single measurement. Uh, so now the conditions um, change a little bit. Uh, in the first case, uh, we have that both D and omega, um, once we take the corresponding cones, so in one direction or, or the other, uh, they must contain the set omega. In the second case, uh, in the case of uniqueness from one single measurement, Remember, previously we only had conditions on V. Now we also require conditions on W. This is because, if you remember from uh, the uh, previous case, the last step was um, or, or required to apply with unique continuation to say that uh, the solution could not vanish in a subset of omega. Now, um, uh, we don't have weak unique continuation as before, but if uh, W is here, so it's contained uh, in the in the cone of all uh, of all points in omega, then if U uh, is equal to zero here, the operator will be also equal to zero there, and we can conclude just because of the anti-locality that then U must be zero there. So. Uh, W will be contained in the cone of any of these uh, possible um, possible uh, sets where we uh, want we want to see that you cannot vanish. So this is why further conditions also appear here. And just to finish, I think I will uh, take less time than uh, what we have. Um, let me just add that here, as I said, I focus on the operators S and A, so symmetric and anti-symmetric. But in our result, uh, we have considered uh, more operators or a generalization of them. In the first case, uh, so in the case of symmetric operators, we have considered uh, operators uh, containing also what I said, uh, anisotropies inside the cone. So our operator looks like before, but here you can see that there is a function which may change with the direction of, uh, of uh, our point Y. So not all points inside the cone or not all the directions inside the cone uh, uh, are or, or present a similar, a similar contribution. And also we could uh, consider, we, we, we do it, uh, uh, linear combinations of the operators S and uh, A we have seen uh, so far. 
So in the case of a combination, um, okay, here uh, for sure, um, I mean, combinations meaning we, we keep something which is not the, the, the opposite of this one. Uh, so not just the difference of these two. So if for any other combination, we have operators seeing both cones, but with different contributions. So one cone, uh, I mean, one cone will have a different weight than the other. So in this case, what we could expect is anti-locality in both uh, cones. And actually, if we are able to uh, obtain uh, anti-locality in one cone for the anti-symmetric operator, so from the one scene, just one cone, and uh, anti-locality in both of them for the symmetric, then uh, we can ensure that these combinations will be also uh, anti-locality in both uh, cones, despite the fact of uh, not uh, being symmetric. So yeah, as I said, this is uh, all from my side. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, Maria Angelis, for the very, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Are there any questions or comments, please? Please feel free to unmute yourself. Any questions or comments? Okay, can I ask a small question? Uh, could you please say a few words about how actually you prove this uh, partial anti-locality, for example, for symmetric operator? Just what is it? Yeah. Uh, okay, I don't need to go there. I mean, so what we have used so far, I mean, it's just uh, based on previous results for fractional Laplacian. So what we have uh, used, okay, I mean, the, there were two settings. One was related with, um, like, knowing that, so let me try to make the picture. So in the first case, we know uh, u vanishes here. Sorry, s of u vanishes there. s of u equals zero there. And then u vanishes not just there, but also below this. So in this case, uh, what it is used uh, is something uh, already used uh, by, by Ankana and Amico, which is based on the fact of having uh, of considering the the Fourier expressions of these things using the Fourier multiplier uh, the Fourier multiplier associated with the with the operator, and seeing that there is a, a branch cut such that um, uh, analyticity uh, can hold only if we assume everything if we have everything is equal to zero. In the other case, which if I not if I remember correctly, is something of this type. <laughs> okay, here I mean, uh, uh, let me, let me, because I have the opportunity to write it. Okay, so it should be like this. Okay, tangents are not working so well for me. So in this case, we know S of U is equal there, and U is equal zero here, but also in this region. So in this case, what we can see is that if we extend uh, u by zero also here, then the operator s of u for u supported maybe only in these uh, smaller cones, then this coincides exactly with the fractional Laplacian applied to u. And then we just uh, invoke the anti-locality of the fractional Laplace. So these are like uh, somehow um, cheap results uh, for, for anti-locality. Thank you very much, very nice. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or comments, please? Any other questions or comments? If not, Thank you very much, Maria Angelis, for the very, very nice talk. And thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much.